Hello, hello. Sorry about the delay, but one of our panelists just got a standing ovation at Echoes, so there was a reason for that delay. <laughs> okay. Um, Welcome. This is day three or 30, but who's counting, of the Sundance Film Festival 2023. My name is Anja Trzebiatowska. I'm one of the programmers here at the festival and also the very lucky curator of this series called Beyond Film. And it is now my pleasure to introduce this conversation that will be moderated by a, a no stranger to Sundance, Effie Brown, who's a remarkable producer. They have been here with many films. Oh, she knows. You know this. <laughs> And, um, and we've been talking about um, controlling the narrative, which means creating your own stories as opposed to waiting for someone to give you permission to do that. So we have some very, um, very professional people to talk about this subject, and we're excited for this conversation. So thank you for being here. And now, over to Effie Brown. Hey, hey, party people, how are you feeling? <laughs> All right, let's start out with some energy. Here we go. I want to introduce, and don't judge me, I took French in high school instead of Spanish, so don't judge. So, Eugenio Derbez. Come on out! What, what? There you go. Thank you, yes! And then Diane uh, Becker, come on out. Yes! And last, but certainly not least, Tommy Oliver. Come on, come on, come on. I love his swagger. Don't, why are we all standing up? I'm nervous, okay, great. It's like a receiving line, like, okay. So we only have an hour, so I'm gonna just really hop right in. We're gonna make this super conversational, and, um, and there's gonna be a little time for questions after, but when you ask your questions, this isn't gonna be pitching, isn't gonna be telling your life story, it's gonna be asking a question in regard to controlling your narrative. Does that make sense? Yes, yes? yes. All right, all right, so let's get started. Eugenio. Yeah. Yeah! <laughs> you nailed it. I know, really, I'm like, thank God, I'm like, oh. Okay, so, let me get myself together. You are a superstar and an icon in your own right, like no lie, right? <laughs> you know, from doing, you're an actor, yeah. you are a director, yeah. and you are a producer. Yeah. Just some of his credits, I know you guys have his bio, but instructions not included, yeah. which made over $100 million. And we're gonna yeah. talk money here because we're talking producing, right? <laughs> over $100 million, right? How to be a Latin lover, also with your company, Three Pass. Did I say it right, maybe? Yeah, what, again, <laughs> oh, Living in Echo Park pays off. Okay, great. Um, you did from Acapulco, and you're here with your movie, Radical, yeah. right? I want you, like you truly are straddling all sorts of worlds, from acting, directing, to producing. Mm -hmm. And you do them really well. Not only do you have it internationally, but you also have it here in the US. Can you talk to me a little bit about how producing helps you with that? Was it something that you had to do in order to sort of, um, I'm gonna call it mogul, yeah. all of those um, sort, of, sort of worlds? Well, let me tell you. I started, uh, I, I, I was an actor, I started as an actor, I just wanted to act. Mm -hmm. And then when I started uh, receiving things that I, I was not happy with, like, uh, uh, you know, roles that I don't like or uh, stories that I don't like, I realized that I had started uh, writing okay. my own stuff, and, and I was not a writer. I was like, but I'm not a writer. So I, I, I started giving it a try because I was really, literally hungry. And um, then uh, I knew, never took a class, but I started writing. And, and with some help with, with some of the friends, I started writing scripts, and I, that's how I got my first TV show. And then I started producing because it was a need. I, I, I realized that um, even I was writing and acting, uh, th there was still someone controlling the thing. And it was not my voice, my real voice. So I said, I need to start um, also producing mm -hmm. and directing. So it's been um, something I needed to do. And actually, producing is not exactly my thing. That's what I have oh, my... Really? Yeah, I mean, I like it. Uh, <laughs> so like, I'm not gonna give it up, but. <laughs> <laughs> I like, I don't like the, all the numbers and the, you know, uh, uh, you know uh, <laughs> the campers and the, uh, you know, the, all, the, all the, the, the technical part, I hate it. That's why I have my business partner, Ben O'Dell, ben. that is here with me. Ben, there Ben, you give him a shout out. He's the guy behind me, he's amazing. Uh, and we built the, our own company, Tripas. Um, and it's, uh, it's been a beautiful journey, but, but uh, I, I, I am a producer uh, n more than for joy, than for, it's for need. Out of necessity. Because I, and out of necessity, because I, I really needed to 
to keep my own voice. In order to, to keep my own voice 100%, not, not change uh, uh, nothing, I needed to produce and, and direct at least. Got it. OK. I'd like, I, yeah. Good to know. I have, a, and I have just a quick follow-up question. And it might be, um, we might get more into it a little later. But it feels that with Three Pass, you're also able to amplify other people's voices, not just exactly. your own. So that is something that you're also, you have yourself, I mean, you're a star, right? <laughs> you know, well, I mean, like, let's not lie. I'm like, you're a real star, like Hollywood Walk of Fame star. Like, you, are, <laughs> you are a legit star. So you're using that, it feels. To yes, I think it's important to give uh, other uh, people like me uh, a voice. Uh, let me tell you really quick an, an anecdote. When I was trying to cross over here in the US, I came many, many times uh, to, with the executives at studios, and I, was, I brought a lot of projects, and they were always telling me, ah, ah, it's, it's, it's too Latin, it's too Mexican. And I was like, and? Yeah. <laughs> I, we, we in Latin America and in Mexico, we've been consuming Hollywood films forever, and we love that. And, and, and we, not because we don't have rockets in Mexico, we don't like Apollo 13. Or Erin Brockovich, the, the, nothing more mm -hmm. specific than Erin Brockovich. It's a story from a lady in, I don't know where, in, in the United States, and we love it. <laughs> what if we tell a story about someone in Mexico? I mean, I, I'm sure the entire world would love it, but they were close to that idea. So right now we're opening, I think our company is opening this um, all, all this changing these minds to, to give voice to all these people like me. Excellent, excellent, excellent. What? That's right. <laughs> Diane, I'm going to skip on over to you. And Diane Becker, you know that you are a prolific and badass producer. And, like you've, and you could just look her up on IMDb. You have like over 40 credits. My favorite, one of my favorites is um, Alaska is a Drag. And then you're also doing Navalny, which you all should know about. And like, best wishes for Tuesday. Like, I feel it for you, girl, with those nominations coming out. And then you're also here with King Cole, right? So these are all like, if you look at your hist um, your filmography, they're very different, you know, from Tina to Belushi to you know what I mean, like to Alaska as a drag, so which is narrative and to nonfiction. Can you talk to me a little bit about? how you found those, because they're all very disparate, but the thing that hangs them all together is their distinctive voice and, that, and their sort of singularity of vision, which to me, I'm considering that controlling the narrative, whatever narrative that is. Can you talk to me a little bit about, do you seek them out? Do they find you? Like, what do you do? Like, what's your, you know, what's your secret sauce? I mean, I wish I had like an actual secret sauce that I could <laughs> impart to everybody here. It's a little bit haphazard. Come on now. But I have, I have my own little sort of saying and sort of philosophy of life, which is it's the people in the project. Like for me, producing is about the people you partner with, the creative collaborations you come in contact with, and then the storytelling, you know? And, and for me, I just love all kinds of stories, you know, and that have distinct vision or distinct point of view or are about you know, something, you know? So, you know, I was talking about Navalny recently and I yeah. kind of described Navalny as like th my spirit, right? Like the, like, you know, the good guy, like fighting the fight, against democracy against- the whole against, regime. Right. Yeah, exactly. You know, just sort of like, um, you know, that kind of spirit. And then King Cole, which no one's seen yet, which I'm really excited to premiere here on Monday, um, I describe in many ways as like my soul. There's something so beautiful and poetic about that. And it was so, it was such an enriching experience to help Elaine McMillian Sheldon kind of take this singular vision that only Elaine could have created and bring it to life. So, you know, I love to partner with, yeah. you know, directors that um, have that distinct voice, right? Um, and or are, are working on something that like just sparks my own curiosity about life and about storytelling. Um, so there's, you know, no necessarily like rhyme or reason to it to some degree, but I just like instinctively kind of know, you know, and mm. projects come to me sometimes, you know, or, um, or sometimes I'm, I'm brought into things and or I will try to seek those things out too, you know. Excellent. And because and you work with, and then just to sort of touch on this a little bit, you work with quite a few different directors. Do you have a strategy? Is it one strategy meets all? Or is it something that you do a little differently with each of them when you're producing and helping them protect the narrative? Or controlled? I'm, I'm going to call it protecting. 
than yeah. set a control. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. yeah, I mean, for me, it's like I've always wanted to be a producer. Like, you yeah. know, I mean, I have a background in photojournalism, um, which makes the world of documentary filmmaking makes sense to me, you know, but I also went to AFI and have a degree, you know, got a graduate you have a degree. degree. You're like, you're like, I got whatever. education. I'm still paying for it. <laughs> <laughs> that's a whole other story. But um, uh, so, you know, that's where I learned some of the craft and learned about screenwriting and, and mm -hmm. you know, and all of that. So I, I think um, for me, um, I just want to support the director's vision. You know what I mean? And for me, it's like film is God. The film mm -hmm. is God, and it will tell us what, what we need to do, right? And so if you're in alignment with your director's vision and you're really supporting them and helping them bring it to the screen, then you know how, you know how to work as a producer in that way. Because mm -hmm. every single project is different. Every single director is different. Yep. And you know, they're not unique snowflakes per se, but they are <laughs> but a little they bit. Are. I was they gonna are, say, like, let's just right? be real. They just mindset. are. Yeah. And, and I kind of love that about them. You know what I mean? Like, you know, Navalny is, the way we made Navalny is so different than the way I made Tina. Yeah. You know? So, um, but e each of those collaborations were incredible. Excellent, thank you for that. All right, so Tommy Oliver, like, I love this man. Like, I'm so proud. I'm just gonna have a little bit of a moment just because, I've known him forever, and I'm so proud of you. I'm so proud of you, because he is not here with not just one film, not just two films, but four films, okay? You know what I mean? I just got like, we have to just give some chat and love, you know what I mean? Like, that's a mic drop right there. You know, you're here with Fancy Dance, Young, Wild, and Free, To Live and Die and Live, and also Going to Mars, the Nikki Giovanni Project. Like, I'm so, so proud of you. And what I love is he's not new to this game, okay? He's been here for over 10 years. You've been producing and directing on your own, you know, for quite, for 10 years. And then I know that you've been at this, but this, this does feel a wee bit like a bit of a coming out party for your company, Confluential <laughs> Films, right? Like, really, I'm just, because what makes you, well, there's a lot of things that make you different besides being extraordinarily talented he can also write a check. Okay, okay? I love this you know what I mean? Like, let's just call it what it is. Do you know what I mean? Let's just, he can write a check. And one of the things I also just have to give love to his wonderful producing partner, Cody. Do you know what I mean? So he wouldn't have been able to do any of this without her. We will always have to give that shout out just to be real about it. But I love, like, I'm so proud of you, and I'm so proud because not only were you able to control the narrative, producing and amplifying voices, but also with the check. And that's kind of what I want to, you knew I was going to talk about that because I'm that lady. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? I'm like, get in your pockets. Hi, what's happening? So, um, so what's interesting to me is like when talking to the directors and the people that have been working with you, you not only support the voice, and the filmmaker like Eugenio and like Diane, right? Do you know what I mean? You also back it up one further with a check. You straddle both sides of that because sometimes, and we'll get into this a little later, the financier and the producer sometimes are at odds with one another and sort of trying, like who controls what? You're both. Can you talk a little bit about that? Tell me everything right now. Okay. <laughs> You're very sweet. No, I'm not, but it's okay. <laughs> Actually, you're not, but that was very sweet. I'm like... <laughs> um, it's been an interesting journey, and I, I find myself in this kind of odd position of filmmaker financier. Yeah. Where I'm a director and a writer and a cinematographer and an editor, and so the conversations that I can have with the other creatives, the directors or the writers or the writer directors, are very different because mm -hmm. they're specific and we as a company are very filmmaker driven and filmmaker supportive and so and director driven and being able to to be that person who believes that the director should have the place to tell the story they want to tell and figure out how to enable them to do that and figure out how to block and tackle in ways that they may not even know because two of the mm -hmm. movies we have here are from first time directors yeah. And so all of the crap that you have to go through, all of the things that are really hard, even being at Sundance, Sundance is great, but it is a crazy thing to navigate for the first time. It can be stressful, it can be hard, it can be something that if you're not prepared for talking and just all of it, it can be, it can turn what should be a marvelous thing into something that is just nothing but stress filled. And so for me, it's finding the, the, this place 
where we can be supportive and we've got to operate responsibly so we get to keep making things, right. but figure out how to be a real partner. And I've had this conversation a lot with the directors, especially Erica, whose film premiered last night. Fancy Dance. Fancy yes. Dance. All right, have you seen it? It's amazing. And Tembi, whose film premieres tomorrow, mm -hmm. were first time making their movie and I just wanted to be supportive of them. And it's not, like one of the things that I think is probably the worst thing that producers do, they'll give notes as though they were making the movie. Ugh. And it's like, you're not making the movie, you're not directing the movie. My job is to understand the movie that you wanna make and then we say yes or no based off of that. And then if there are things that are inconsistent with that, hey, here's this thing that's not quite landing. Here's this thing that's not quite doing what you wanted it to do. And we talk about that versus here's what I would do. I'm not directing it, so what the hell difference does that make? And so being in that place where controlling the narrative is picking the stories and supporting the people so that they can tell the story that they want to tell and have the resources to be truly enabled and without shackles to be able to win. Excellent. High five with that. Okay. So I'm going to um, sort of riff a little bit, and, like, and this is where the sort of conversation part comes in. You mentioned something called, I know how to block and tackle, mm -hmm. right, potential problems. And I think as a producer, that's a lot that what we do. And I think you walking in as a financier, mm -hmm. you have a different seat at the table to block and tackle. You as a star, right, you know what I mean? It, you're a quadruple threat. Do you find it's different when you walk into a room to help someone else sort of um, can keep the clarity of their vision? Do you find that that helps like your triple threat, quadruple threat? Uh, well, I, 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 I agree in what he said. I think that uh, you, are, you always have to support the director, right. know, no matter what. Even when you're not the director. Even when you're not a director. Um, uh, in my case that I've been directing, there's nothing more stressful and, and, and frustrating than when someone doesn't understand your vision. And, um, and it happened to me with, a, I did a movie called Instructions Don't Include It. Uh, it took we me- just, it, it, to that yeah. like that. It was a big, big success, big success. It took me 12 years because Ooh. nobody wanted to, pro to produce it. Um, because I, I was a comedian from the television and, and nobody wanted to uh, bet on me. And then um, uh, uh, six years after we started the process, Sony said, we're interested, but you have to change the end. And, and I was like, but that, that, that's the, the entire, the core of the movie is the, the end of the movie. I don't want to spoil it for you, but uh, I, I'm not changing it. Well, we're not producing it. And I said, no, and I, Prefer not to do the movie, but not change the the, mm -hmm. the ending. Good for you, right? Yeah, Word. yeah. That shit happens so much in this industry. Yeah, but let me tell you, the the the, the best part of this is that um, six years later, twelve in total, I was able to, I was able to produce it, and uh, it became the highest grossing Spanish language film ever world ever worldwide. ever hundred over a hundred million dollars like that hundred million dollars and the guy who told me to change the ending contacted me uh, just the week after we opened and he said I'm sorry I, I, I was wrong does he still have a job he invited me for a dinner and he <laughs> said I'm sorry I was wrong ah! You were right, and I would like to work with you again. <laughs> well, not again, I mean in the right. future. But that happens so much, where people will come in with a yep. story that is culturally specific, that they know how to tell, and then it gets bastardized, and it doesn't work, and they're like, look, these movies don't work. Yeah, because in order to actually make that movie, we had to compromise again Ever. and again mm -hmm. and again and again, and then it's not the movie that it should have been. Mm -hmm. And so saying no is so important, yes. being patient to make sure you can tell the story the way that you need to tell it, otherwise it does not work. And so that's why being able to, to be in these seats, it's why it matters, why having people who understand it, why having people who don't have to force it into, it's like you, you look at this room, you look like out there, what does that look like? It's a bunch of old white men. Like seriously, like on, oh, on not the in wall. this room. Not no, in this not, room. Not, not, not in, in this crowd. room. I mean, on the wall. I know. Really, we're like, damn. <laughs> but it's okay. just like, I know all the old white men are like, what? We're here supporting. <laughs> but but for They're so long, about the decor. Okay. For so long in this industry, there was one gaze. There was one type of person who said yes, and it was a white man. And then if the film didn't fit that one perspective or somebody's understanding of it 
then it either didn't get made or it got bastardized. 100%. And sometimes there were people who were supportive, but not enough. And so what happens is you don't have enough of those movies that make it through. Hundred percent, and I mean, I think that's why it's so important, especially when you're working with first-time filmmakers, too. Like, I love working with young directors because you know you can see the freshness of what their point of view is and like their passion. And as a producer, your job is to really sort of build a protective fence around that, mm -hmm. right? And do everything you can to support that. You know, I'm working on something now where we are working with a first-time filmmaker, doesn't really have a lot of experience, per se in the direct space as a director, but has worked in and around the industry, um, but it's a personal story, and literally nobody else can tell it. And, you know, she was told a number of times, you should let someone else direct this. Yeah. And when we had a meeting with her, and she told us her story, we were like, well, of course you're directing this. Of, of course, there's nobody else. And this is, you know, myself and my producing partner, Mel Miller at Fishbowl Films, like, we really love working with first time filmmakers and making those fences for them. Yeah, we don't take the thing that makes it special only to water it down. Exactly. 100%, but that's easy, I mean with love in my heart. I'm just Easy a, to say. Easy to say because you're writing the checks. No, and someone who's been no, in, no, 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 I'm like, no. I'm like, I'm I only, I only recently old, just started writing I checks. Like I've, been, I've been this way my yes. entire career. No, and that's why you're successful. I agree with you with that part. I've said I'm no just, to so many things. I know, which and, is why, but I'm sorry, we're family, can you tell? Like this is not, like I would never do this. I'm not, I would like, you know what I mean? They're like, ooh, this is getting a little hostile. I'm like, there's love. We've known each other forever. But no, there's, but I want it, because there's producers here, you know what I mean? And it would be great to be like, say no. You know what I mean? And you're like, you will be poor and broke and you'll not make your movie if you say no a lot. Like you had, and I would mean this with love in my heart, you are a successful actor. So you were able, in those 12 years of getting it done, you were doing movies, you were yes. doing things. So like, let's just not get it twisted. Do you know what I mean? And you as well, you were line producing, producing, and you had multiple projects. You did something that was really smart, is that you had a TV, and I'm just paraphrasing, with, you, know, you had a TV show, Black Love, that you owned, you produced, you finance, and you were able to license it. So you were able to stay in control, which gave you the leverage I'm just gonna say, stop it. I'm so, I'm right. Sorry, I'm right. Partially, partially. Look, there was a time where I was making my first studio movie. Yes. And the the studio head, he offered me a movie to. It was a. Oh, I remember that. Yeah, yeah it yeah, was yeah. like a thirteen that, million yeah. dollar movie to, yeah, yeah, yeah. to direct, and the script had problems, and we talked about the problems. Right. And he didn't get it. And he wanted to make the lowest common denominator version of it, which I was uninterested in. Right. And so I passed on it. And this was to direct. I made one movie. It was a small movie. And here's an opportunity to make a studio movie with a star attached. But because I did not think it was the right setup and it wouldn't have got there, I passed without any understanding of what was going to happen next. And so there was no Julie, black no, love no, no, at that right, point. But, you, but that spark, sorry, we're really going to get together. Sorry. But like, I know. They're like, but like, but you said no to that. And then you and Cody did Black Love. You bet on yourself. Correct. But I also okay. said no to the idea of doing more movies with that. Duly noted. No, like, and I'm saying that's a duly, like, duly noted with that. But I do, I just want to give a little <laughs> bit. Not everyone has your um, vigor and, like, you know, and access to resources t right now, right? And it's a new, and I mean this respectfully, the world, and I'm dating myself because you are not even, you're, you're, what, 20 years younger than, I'm 51. Like, I remember seeing you come up, baby. Do you know what I mean? I'm 38. I'm 38, oh, I hate him so much. So, <laughs> you're like, oh, okay, great. But you know what I mean? But like, you're, you know, you're, the world is different 10 years ago, and I can speak, like, there was no like real streamers, remember? I mean, the world is different now than it was then. So if folks now, to be like, do you still recommend, and I open this up to everybody, when you can't say no, right? You wanna get your movie made. You can't say no. How do you work within that system to still be able to block and tackle? You can always say no. Otherwise you get the bastardized okay, version you know of this movie. Let somebody else answer the question, Tommy, okay? <laughs> do you know what I'm saying? You know, I think you need to know the difference between saying no because you're defending your point of yeah. view mm -hmm. and being stubborn. Mm -hmm. Ooh, that's something that's different good. because sometimes you okay, say, good job. Eh, this is, I, I went to that panel and I'm saying no to everyone. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. 
and, and I will see you, you on the street corner begging. Like. Yeah. No, I, I remember, uh, I, I, you should always listen. I remember that, that, the, that oh, script, they were telling me constantly, you should change this and this and this and this and this. And I was just listening. And I was like, yes, maybe, no. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. for example, the ending, no. Mm -hmm. This is a no. Uh, but I, I'm going to finance the entire movie. I don't care, it's no. Mm -hmm. But this one, for free, I, was, I would change it. <laughs> maybe you're right. So you need to know when to change and when to say no and when to maybe change whatever they are asking you to change. So don't be stubborn. Mm -hmm. You're listening. Listen. Yeah, Go ahead. I mean, yeah. that's the, that is the talent and the superpower of a producer, right, is to be able to see that stuff and then be able to communicate with your director as you're collaborating on this and going, okay, I know you want to, I'm going to protect your vision here, but let's talk through this thing. Is this reasonable? Is it unreasonable? Uh, yeah, yeah, How yeah. does this affect what you're telling? Is this is this a give you can give, or is this a give? Or, or are we keeping this card, right? Yep. And and as a producer, you're hovering above, right? They're uh -huh. mired in the details, and you're trying to hover above and come into the details. Yep. So That's if you're a good put. producer, you can fly in and out of this, and you can have those conversations, and then be able to kind of go back to these people and go, you know what? We will do this, but we're not going to do that. And I'm happy to put my line in the sand, and then we can move forward from that. And then at least you know you're in a dance with, you know, with everybody. And that's right. what producers are constantly doing. That's blocking and tackling, right? Yep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Excellent. They go, high five, Tommy's like, that's what I said. <laughs> but no, it's, being, it's being pragmatic about yeah, it. Exactly. And so not being overly precious, not being overly stubborn, yeah. but still knowing the things that are important. But you as a, as a producer or a filmmaker, you have 100%. to be able to articulate the things that are important. Because if everything is important, nothing is important. That's and so you figure out the things that you absolutely understand are the essence of your story, and then you fight for those. And the other things, it's fine to let go because you don't want to just look up and it's been 20 years and you haven't made something. Exactly. Okay, there are pearls being dropped here today. I just have to say, like, y'all pay attention to this. Here's another question. I'm going to take a little bit of a different tact because we've all been in this for a quick minute. Have you ever, can you talk a little bit about where maybe you were a little bit stubborn, maybe you made the wrong call, and how you pivoted out of that, because not all, not every time we're human beings. You know what I mean? We're allowed. To, Tommy's like, I've never made a mistake. <laughs> okay, I love him. I'm like, can you talk a little bit, you know, about that of like, oof, or maybe pivoting or navigating sort of a difficult situation. None of them. They've, it's always been cake for all of them. I'm like, I will go. I'm like, I'm like every single every single film has one of those. I mean, you know, like, give, us, give us a little taste because I find a lot of times when people come to these panels, everyone hears about how badass and easy it is and like how they did it, but they don't get to hear about the war stories and the shitty times. Do you know what I mean? That frankly we go through. It takes a lot of perseverance, and you guys said a lot of it. Do you know what I mean? But like. Can you talk a little bit about like, here's something that I might have made a mistake and this is what the repercussion was or how it's able to sort of finagle out? I mean, I could do a whole master class on it. We have no time today, right. but Alaska is a drag. Yes. We had some legit financing problems, guys and gals. And, and you know, the problem was is when you're making a really tiny independent film with not a very big budget, mm -hmm. you don't need a lot of money to get started. You don't need a lot of money for the SAG bond. You don't need a lot of money for prep. And so when you're, and when you have a schedule that really can't move and you're trying to get the yeah. rest of the financing like in place, and they keep telling you it's a day or it's a day or it's a day and you just kind of keep trusting the partners you're working mm -hmm. with and then you get there and then it the, literally the floor falls out. And that happened on that film. Mm -hmm. And it was insane because we literally only had four days left to finish production and we knew the only way that film was gonna get saved was to somehow persevere on. And so we just took a financial risk and made it happen and begged everybody to help us out. And then we spent literally almost five years trying to figure it out. Mm. So I, I just, so in terms of being stubborn, there's also, you have to also understand like, when is this not working, right? Like, Ooh, am I, good when good. is this not working? And, and trusting your gut a little bit. And I think we had markers along the way that we did not, we're not fully paying attention to. Now having said that, we finished the movie it's, it's, it's one of, I love it. I love that movie. So I love that movie. Sometimes you, it, you know, you keep mm -hmm. going. How about you, Inyo? I, I, I've been thinking something. I did a, a 
But uh, <laughs> he's, all like, he's all like, it's being filmed and I can't talk about it right now. I, know I have several of those, trust to believe. <laughs> yeah, sometimes. No, I'm trying to remember something like that, but. Uh, That's uh, okay, don't put you on the spot. Don't they like, oh, it's okay. I'll, I'll jump in and as soon he's as like, I remember. Okay, no worries. He's all like, I'm perfect, but go ahead. Go ahead. I'll, I'll offer a lesson that's come out of it, which Great. is just for, for me and for us, it's so much about the people. Mm. And I am uninterested in being in business with people that I don't actually want to go to dinner with. And Word. if I don't want to have, if I don't want to spend time with you because I have a wife who I love and three young boys, the opportunity They're adorable, costs, by the way. Not just the wife, but the boys are cute. But the opportunity cost is so high where I love spending time with them. And so the idea of being away from them for a project with people who aren't good people, it's just not worth it. I don't care how great the project is. I don't care what the prospects are. And so I need the combination of good people and good projects. Otherwise, it's just not worth it. Because I've gone through those situations where you look down at your phone and you just get the pit in your stomach when you see that name and I'm good. I'm not doing it. I don't care how big of a star you are. I don't care what the studio is. I don't care whatever it is. And I know it's not nice, but it's like I'm at the point in my career where I'm just like, I have no problem telling anybody to fuck off. Where it's just like, Ugh, I'm 51 and I still can't say that. You're 38. Where it's just like, I just don't, I just don't care. It's like I'm not interested in operating in a way where people aren't leading with integrity. Oh, that's where, 100 percent. Where it's knowing that the people that you're working with, that you can trust them, it's so it's worth so much more than the best lawyers in the world, and I mean that. I knowing mean. that they're not trying to screw you over, knowing that you've got mutually aligned interests, and so that comes out mutually of mutually aligned been interests. Difficult yeah. experiences with people where you don't have that alignment. I high five. I mean, thank you for that. We're gonna go to questions, but I just wanna just sort of do a quick recap of that because there's some really beautiful nuggets, you know, block and tackle, block and tackle, but also when you're talking about listening, there's a difference between being stubborn, right? So, and being able to listen and to be able to take other people's, you know, opinions. So I really think I really, really appreciate you guys going to the heart of this. Um, like I said, we're going to open it up to questions. Please don't ask him to finance your films or be in the movie or anything like that. Like, don't embarrass me now. Unless it's absolutely incredible they, they, with really good people. And, oh, and they all think it's incredible. Like, everybody has, you know. Um, so there you go. Are we just raising hands? Boop, boop. All right. Where's the lady? Because that's how I'm going to roll. No lady wants to ask a question? Go ahead. There you go, sis. Go ahead. You. Yeah, I'm looking at you. Go ahead. Ooh, good question. I, that's my moderating question. That, I asked that question. Yeah. It's wanting to tell stories authentically is what it really came down to for us. And so Confluential Films is the confluence of art, entertainment, and business told culturally, specifically, and authentically. Many of the only people who are telling the stories that we're telling are the ones who should be telling those stories. And so early on seeing the difference between people who are telling stories because they think, oh, there's an opportunity here versus this is a story that I have to tell. And then figuring out a way to make sure that you can do that in a way that's commercially viable. Because if you're not thinking about that, you don't get to keep making projects. True that. How about for Fishbowl Films or Tree Pass? I mean, I think for me, it was, I started out wanting to make scripted films mostly, oh, right? Yeah. And you know that was kind of where my guiding light was. And then I, um, you know, kind of came of age as a producer during the writer's strike and the financial collapse in like 08. Mm -hmm. And it was really hard to like get anything off the ground. And I got offered a job on a documentary and I took that job. And I wound up working with like some of the most successful producers in the documentary space, yeah. John Batsik and Julie Goldman. And all of a sudden I was like, oh my God, like I love this kind of storytelling. And it was so, it's so different. Documentaries are so, they're so much harder to like, there's just something really interesting about making them. And then I realized that I have, I love photojournalism and I, you know, I had, it was a natural inclination that I hadn't quite been paying attention to. And so for me, then all of a sudden I realized I didn't have to box myself into one kind of storytelling. I could really mm. just be attracted to whatever I was passionate about. And, you know, I think that's really important, you know? Excellent. How about you? Well, I, I, I want to talk a little bit about what she was saying. I, I, I've been a comedian my entire life uh, and I, I started doing comedy and I love it. But lately, I, I wanted to change a little bit uh, that, and I, I wanted to, 
do something more deep and, and meaningful, mm -hmm. not just make people laugh. I, I, I now I, I want to make people laugh, but also make people think and feel. Mm. And uh, when you're trying to change your path and you are already a commercial um, mm -hmm. brand, let's mm -hmm. say, um, sometimes studio, they, they just want to make money yeah. of you. And sometimes you came up with a, an idea like, I want to make something different. I want to make something meaningful. I want to tell this story. And they're like, no, but we want you to make money. That's it. <laughs> so um, talking about... Uh, uh, what was the name of the panel? Um, controlling the controlling narrative. The narrative. Uh, we're here in this uh, festival with a movie called Radical that I, we had to produce yes. because uh, it was hard to do it. Even though uh, I have already a name and, mm -hmm. a, and a career, um, it was hard for us to, to pull up this movie because it was, it's a drama, not a comedy. But thank God we today we we got an standing ovation, so I'm, yes. I'm happy with it. Congratulations! Excellent. All right, I'm going to you, and then I'll go to someone over on the other side. Ooh, money or partnership? Yes, go. I mean, I would go with partnership. I mean, I, I, I think it's kind of like Field of Dreams. If you build it, they will come, right? Like, if you have a great project and a great story and you have a great partner to create that, you will find the money eventually. You will figure it out. But Agreed. if you have money and you don't have somebody that has your back or that, you That's know, true. then you're struggling the whole time. And sometimes directors don't realize that until they, they kind of, you know, be like... They come back eventually. They're like, oh, I miss you. Like, I miss you a yeah, little bit. I agree. Um, it's better to have a, a good co collaborators than money. Excellent. And Tommy, who has both. Okay, so he does like the swagger, like, that's all right, sure. Love. Go ahead, how about it? Were you were right over here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm going to get you. Ooh. That's a great question. What would make you step back from a project? I just paraphrase, sorry. <laughs> One thing, talking about the financing side, it, there are often times where people don't understand the market or they don't do 10 minutes yeah. of research mm -hmm. and they will try to make something or they'll try to say this project costs something that is significantly out of line with where the, where the marketplace is. <laughs> It just it happens all the time, and so it's here's this here's this movie that's fifteen million dollars, and it's an independent movie. What are you gonna do with this movie? Like, what's your what's your plan? You don't have giant stars in it, and it's going to necessitate a massive sale. Which sure you might get lucky, but I'm not in the business of planning to get lucky. And so, how do you figure out how to make something responsibly? And if people aren't thinking about those things, then that's a turnoff because. I don't want to be in a fight with somebody where this movie, you're saying it costs $15 million, but in reality, it should be a $4 million movie, and maybe it's a $7 million movie, and so there's upside, but you want to, for me, plan for what's the base case. How do you expect this thing to, to work so that there's upside? But you can't make a, you can't have a movie budgeted for what a studio would, would make it for as an independent yeah. film. And so those are the things where it just shows me that there is a, a lack of understanding or a lack of research, and I is just not ready for us to have a conversation. Understood. How about you, Wes? What is something that would make you back away from a project or a person? I mean, I think for me, it would, it, it would have to be more about the collaboration, mm -hmm. you know, because I give so much to my teams and yeah. my projects that if I feel like there's no communication or I feel like there's not enough respect, yep. mutual respect, yeah. um, you know, it's like you don't need to, you don't need to take my advice, you don't need to, but you need to listen, right? You need to at That's least true. give me a seat at the table and then let me help you. Um, and I feel like if there isn't enough of that, then that just feels really tiring for me, right? Life's short. Understood. How about you, Hinya? In my case, uh, it has to resonate with my voice. Um, sometimes it could be a good project, 
but it's just not in my wheelhouse. So uh, don't feel rejected if sometimes someone doesn't want to produce something that you're bringing to the table. It's just that probably they, they would not under, and it's better for you. Probably if a producer that, is, that doesn't understand your voice takes your project, it's going to ruin it. Sometimes oh, it's that's life. Really true. Life or universe is telling you this is not the guy. Or gal. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> you right here, 32. Go ahead. <laughs> So you're going to have to translate that for us a little bit? I'm like this. I remember I took high school French. Help us out a little bit. Okay. And, uh, he said, telling me that, uh, that uh, well, a lot of compliments. Thank you very much. He said, I was amazing. <laughs> okay, we got that. He said that I'm great. <laughs> right. uh, he, uh, that what is my advice for all these kids that are watching um, what I've done all these years uh, in, in this country, especially? Um, I would say... To, to keep uh, their point of view, to keep their uh, fighting for what they believe, um, and to produce their own material. They, they, we, I'm, the best advice I can give them is don't wait uh, someone to open the door, because um, we always go and knock at the door and ask for a job. Mm -hmm. Don't ask for a job. We are 8 billion people in this planet. Mm. You have to br knock at the door to bring a project, not to ask for a job. So knock at the door and bring a project. Excellent. Thank you. Anyone who goes? Anyone? Oh, we have time for one more. All right, let's go to, is there a lady? I know, I'm sorry, I'm just going to, no? No other women? Right oh, right, right, again. Oh, you already asked one. No, you didn't. I'm lying to you. Go ahead. I lied. <laughs> I know, right, Matthew, you don't look alike. It's okay. Go ahead. Go ahead. Answer the, ask the question. So, I'll start with a joke. How do you become a millionaire as a film investor? You start as a billionaire. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh my God, okay, I won't tell my investors that, but that's funny. <laughs> so, there is a as, a, as a producer, as a director, as whatever, I think there's a real responsibility to making sure that we are making things at a number that makes sense. And oftentimes people will, you know, they'll think about what a movie costs. They'll talk to a line producer, they'll talk to a UPM, and it costs this much without thinking about what it's worth in the marketplace. And so it's, for me, doing the work beforehand, figuring out how to be responsible, figuring out how to make sure that as a potential steward of somebody else's money that you're doing your part beforehand. And I've always thought that luck is the intersection of preparation and opportunity. And so if you've done that, if you are super responsible and diligent, it becomes a little bit easier where it's not, hey, I'm going to do this thing or I'm going to think about it or yeah, I'll go do the budget. And then it takes four weeks between that conversation and when you actually have something and then at a time you've, you've lost it. And so it's trying to be as ready as possible. And then there are people who want to put money into things, but it, they need to feel as though that you are doing your best. And yes, art matters, mm -hmm. and telling stories matter, but making sure that we are thinking about the business of it. And going back to, again, what Confluential is, it's the confluence of art, entertainment, and business. And for us, all three of those things matter. And when you do that, like you're saying, it's like, there is money out there. There are people out there who want to do things, but they want to be able to know that they can trust people to handle their money, to handle things well. And even if it doesn't go well, it's not going to be for lack of planning. It's not going to be for lack of diligence or lack of understanding the marketplace because it costs nothing to do research. It costs nothing to be fully informed in what's going on. And so I think the more we can do that as, as, as producers, the better we are to be able to take advantage of those conversations or people when we do meet them. Awesome. We have two minutes left. I want to thank you all. For, you did great questions. I was very, very proud. Thank you. <laughs> Parting words. 
before we wrap this up? Um, well, uh, uh, I just want to, I just want to re, re, um, recall to what I said before about uh, bringing a, a project and, and trust your instincts. Um, I know that uh, sometimes it's hard to find someone who finance your, your, that now that we were talking about money and doesn't matter if you, ha you don't have the money. It's better to have a good idea than to have money. So mm. don't spend your time looking for money or for investors. Spend your time looking for someone who can help you uh, make your project better or your script better because any good script will open any door in Hollywood. Great, excellent. Thank you for that. <laughs> Diane? Yeah, I mean, I think for me, and I don't know what everyone's sort of level in here is, is that, but you know, I started coming to this festival many years ago, like so many years ago. Yeah, my mom. Like, kind of like when IndieWire started and yes. we had a school newspaper <laughs> and we would run around covering the festival. Like I was a cinephile. And I, all I knew is I wanted to figure out how to make movies and be in this business. And it's kind of like having an out-of-body experience sitting here talking about it now. But all that to say, if you're passionate about it, you just have to figure out ways to like find good stories, partner with good people, keep moving forward, and just keep trying to find those collaborators and those people out there, you know? Because they really are out there. Word. Bring us home, Tommy. Bring us home. I want to thank Sundance. And for me, it's, it's kind of nutty, where I was here with my first film that I ever made in 2011. And to, to be here at Sundance, to be on the stage, it's, it's all a bit crazy. But it's anybody here can do it. And it's just about patience and intention and being committed to what we want to do. And so I am really happy to be up here with the three of you, and especially you who I've known for so long. <laughs> and it's just, Sundance is a special place. It really is. And really being is. here, it feels like summer camp. Being able to just walk but down the street. But very cold summer camp. <laughs> cold summer camp. <clears throat> Um, but it's just special. It's yeah. special, and so I appreciate all of what Sundance has done for so many filmmakers and for so many people who want to put art in the world in a way that matters, and so yeah. I'm just humbled to, to be here. Excellent. That's a great note to end on. It's gratitude. <laughs> Thank you all so much. It was a privilege and a pleasure. And remember, vote for their films. Vote for their films. Audience <laughs> Awards.